uh, one of my favorite parts about this is, is that with iron casting, it's inherently dangerous what we're doing. You literally are putting your existence and your livelihood in other people's hands. So these people around you become very close friends. You, you literally forge a, fr- a bond that is like through fire and it makes it a deeper connection than just people kind of meeting and hanging out, you know? Um, and I think that's why these are so much fun because it's a family reunion every time I have these things. Howdy, folks. Welcome to the podcast Iron. My name is Laura Mullen Vermilia, and on this podcast, I interview members of the Cast Iron Art community in order to inspire, educate, and spread ideas about iron casting and cast iron art. On today's episode, I chat with sculptor and metal artist Kelly Ludeking. Kelly shares his exciting journey of being introduced to iron casting and how his love for this process and its community has developed into his annual cast iron art event called the Down on the Farm Iron Pour. Kelly, thank you so much for giving me the joy to interview you, even though I know you're very busy right now getting ready to host the Down on the Farm Iron Pour, which is only two and a half weeks away. For all of you listening or watching, thanks so much for tuning in, and please enjoy. Welcome, Kelly Ludeking. Thank you. I appreciate this uh, opportunity. Good to see you. It's been a long time. I know. I'm trying to think. Peoria. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Peoria 2019. That was the last time. Fall. Yeah. It was like November 1st or something or something. Not to be super specific right at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but it was, uh, that was a really good time. I was kind of like, wasn't sure I was going to make that one, but I just kind of wanted to come in and surprise and support everybody there. I Well, so this is kind of really funny, but I saw you in the crowd and I wanted to scream like with excitement, <laughs> but I just felt like it would be really inappropriate at that moment to just let out a blood curdling like stream of excitement. And so I had to hold it back and I just like silently ran over and gave you a hug and (laughs) it was really great to see you. And it's always great to see you and it's great to see you now. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And um, I actually don't know like literally anything. I'm coming to you as a blank slate. And so I'm really interested to hear your story. So usually I start off with, or well, do you, I start off with Kelly Ludeking. Well, who the hell are you anyways? (laughs) I love that. Um, Well, my name is Kelly Ludeking. Um, I grew up uh, in Northeast Iowa on a, on a farm, a 200 acre farm uh, where I learned a lot of stuff. I mean, we had dairy, beef, pigs, all the crops to go along with it by age five, basically once you're able to actually do something on a farm, you're working. Um, So that's helped build a really strong work ethic and uh, also a really great base to become a sculptor because um, everything you do on there is uh, hands. You're you're using your hands to build and move and create. And you really learn how to use your body when you're like baling hay and like uh, manipulating and and standing on a wagon while it's moving and moving hay around. And it's like, it's kind of a crazy thing to grow up in. And, uh, you know, and then also uh, my play area was around in the trees and in the hay mound. And um, uh, I was actually this last weekend, I was at at home uh, cleaning up the farm with a bunch of my iron crew, uh, getting it ready. And I was reminiscing about my childhood with them. And they were just all like, whoa, because the we have a landfill right next door to my farm. And uh, my dad and I had this thing where we'd go to the landfill and take a bunch of the trash there. We'd take trash there within a trailer. And on the way home, we, well, we kind of always ended up with stuff coming home with us because we would find like a drills that cord was, was a little bad or something and a circular saw and maybe like Um, I'd find a TV and I didn't really understand how TVs work. So I'd take this TV home and like gut it and open it up and figure out everything and save the speakers out of it. Cause I wanted to put that in the barn for music and, uh, wire it up. And, um, so my childhood was a lot of this weird thing where we'd go to the landfill and come back with like all this treasure and a lot of this stuff that became like probably the impetus for my found object work in the future that I never really thought about, you know, but, uh, 
it's like this, this playground that I got to have. And my dad was like, okay, we got to take a cord from this one and we're going to fix that one. We're going to put these parts together and make this thing, you know, um, cause we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, I grew up on a farm and we, you know, everything we had was there. And I always, one of my jokes, when people ask me what my childhood was like, I was like, well, I had Lincoln logs, but I had to carve them myself. <laughs> You know, I mean, and it kind of true, actually, yeah. I was lucky if I got a matchbox car once in a while and that, but not saying that I didn't have a full, beautiful childhood. It was just a lot different than a lot of kids. Um, um, but it was very rich for sure. Um, in those experiences. And my grandfather was a, a maker also. Um, my grandfather was a small stature man. Uh, he was like five to 120 pounds. Um, and he, he was running the farm and, uh, he couldn't physically do a lot of the things that he needed machinery to do. So he actually made in machinery. He actually has inventions, uh, U.S. patents that he made uh, in the 1930s uh, for unloading uh, uh, hay and foliage and different things like that. Um, so that creativity to make something, well, this doesn't, this is too hard for me. I need to make something to make that work is where I get a lot of that. And then my dad kind of inherited that too, that same mentality. It's like, if I can't do this, let's make something mechanical to do this. Um, and so I was blessed to have my grandfather, my grandpa Kelly, who I'm named after, um, around me a lot when I was a child and also uh, um, going to school and that I'd have to stay at his house if I was going to any of the um, after school programs that I was in. So that was my formidable, like early on, and I never thought of myself as a creative. I had friends that were really good at drawing and painting and music and all this. Even though I was in band, I was in theater, I was in art classes, I was in all that stuff. I was doing all the creative stuff, but I always felt like I was never good at it um, until I found photography. Um, and in high school, um, I was just about my junior year. Uh, I was about to go into my junior year and uh, they had a chance for uh, a couple of students to go to Iowa State University journalism program in the summer to study to be photographers for the yearbook. And man, I was doing anything to get off the farm to not work all summer and a chance to go to a college and hang out when I was in high school. I was like, yeah, that sounds great. I'll do that. So I signed up for it and went down and I took the photography. I hadn't even really shot photos at that point. So I went down there kind of as a blank slate and uh, picked up photography quick. Like even the instructors are like, are you sure you've never done this before? I just understood the apertures, the film speed, shutter speed, all the different things. And then when we got into the dark room, I would got to the point where I'd rarely use even test strips because I could look at a photo and know exactly what to set it at. Wow. Um, I still do it, but uh, so that was kind of this thing where I finally found something that I was good at and, uh, and you know, that I could do. And at that time I was in a uh, skater punk band too. So I was like photographing the punk scene. I was photographing skateboarding and all my buddies and stuff too. And it's just, uh, some of this stuff is so funny because like uh, listening to Andrew Marsh's talk too, yeah. and him being a punk. And I'm just like, oh man. And we've already talked about all this too, which is the best part about it. You know, it's like watching everybody else's videos that you've done so far. It's like this thing where we have many common threads of our, our of our past and uh, and how we came to where we're at and how iron has you know led us down a really bizarre path but our backgrounds is is all equally weird and fun yeah, yeah. and i love that but uh um that's a little bit of the beginnings of uh my 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 thing cuz then i you know photography is actually what got me into art school um okay. i went to uh, college first uh, cause I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. I wasn't sure. And I was thinking about going to the military, um, out of high school. Cause my grades kind of weren't great in high school. Um, cause I was in a skater punk band playing the backs of bars and, you know, like, what do I need to go to college for? Um, but my dad talked me into it. My mom was working at a college where I had tuition exchange and I was like, I, I should go. But my dad talked me out of going to the military because I was thinking that route. And uh, he's like, you're, you're the first of our kids to actually have the opportunity to go to school. Take it. Um, and um, I had three older sisters and, uh, and they're like, you should, my dad's like, you should go, you know? And uh, so I went to school and I went to just a regular liberal arts college uh, in the twin cities and walked in as a freshman and uh, just kind of jokingly signed up to be on the, uh, the newspaper uh, photography thing. And I was like, 
walked in, did a couple of shoots for them. And they're like, holy crap, you're better than anybody we've ever had here. Do you want to be the photo editor for the newspaper? And I'm like, as a freshman, I walked in and took over the photo department uh, wow. and had my own dark room. And then, um, um, then the yearbook eventually about a month later, it found out that they, nobody had been taking pictures for the yearbook. And so I walked in with my three ring binder and they were all like, yes, you want to be the photo editor of this too. And they were both paid positions. I had oh, like at the photo place to buy all the stuff I needed. And then the drama department was hiring me on the side and uh, the band was hiring me on the side. And I had all the football players wanting their own shots. And I started making money doing this. I'm like, man, this is great. I need to be a photographer full time. Um, and I actually ended up getting a national photo shoot out of it through a, a magazine called the Lutheran magazine. Cause they'd came in town and saw my work and hired me instead of somebody, someone else. And mm -hmm. so then I was like, man, I should really look into this photo thing. So um, a friend of mine was going to MCAD from my hometown. And so I'd been going there and seeing their photo department. I was blown away by Minneapolis College of Art and Design. That's what MCAD stands for. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I was just like, I need to go there. And somehow my mom, working at this other college, Luther College in Decorah, got tuition exchange from Luther to MCAD. I don't know how she did it, but my mom, go mom, stuff, go mom. I know, uh, managed to do that. And it was just like, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, it still cost me money. I didn't get like full on, but MCAD wasn't exactly a cheap college to go to. I mean, it was a high end. I mean, pretty much like maybe not RISD, but it, you know, like, uh, yeah. art Institute of Chicago. I mean, it was on those levels. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I got my foot in the door there to go for photography and boy, I got there in photography and I was just like, hated it. They made me take photo one. Oh, back to the beginning, back to the beginning. And I'm like, really? They're like, well, we don't know what your skill level is. And I'm like, really? I just ran two photo, two different photo departments. I've been nationally published. Like, are you kidding me? So I was a little irritated with them. Well, I don't blame you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I still, so then I went through the process of taking the classes and I did photo one, which is all black and white. And then I did photo two, which is color. And I just was not liking it. I just was kind of like in a, a mood about it. And at that time I was meeting a couple of really good friends there in uh, some of the 3d classes. And I, we had foundation 3d. And then I took another 3d class right after that. And, uh, um, and with a couple of really great professors, but the head professor of sculpture, we had like four sculpture professors there, um, was Michael Bigger. Um, and uh, he came up to me after, after my first year and was like, you know, you're, you're a good photographer, but I've been watching you in the shop and you could be a great sculptor. Let me teach you. And I was like, I changed my major right there because I was kind of done with the photo thing. I love photography. I like doing it for myself. Um, and I just didn't dig what they were doing at the school. So, yeah, that's kind of where I got into the sculpture thing. And we lucked out because uh, a, a year or so early, a couple of years earlier, um, Kurt Deerhog was one of Michael Bigger's earlier students. And Kurt went on to grad school right after that under Wayne. And then... Kurt had just graduated the year we, I, the second year I was in, I don't know, that was it the second year, the second year. Yeah. Um, Kurt had just started teaching. He'd gotten out of grad school from Wayne and knew how to cast iron and started teaching at a college in St. Paul um, called college of visual arts and invited us over for the first iron pour he was going to have out of college and, uh, and invited us over because Michael was his old professor and he wanted to bring his students from MCAT over. So I got to be there for that first iron pour and the guys that I was running with now, we'd already done aluminum and we'd already done bronze at school. And I was totally like fascinated by it. I loved it. And, you know, I would welded growing up on the farm and I knew how to weld. And at Augsburg, I took some sculpture classes and I was oxyacetylene welding and other things. So I was like, that stuff was like intriguing and I liked it. But after seeing that first iron pour, I was like, my buddies and I were like, that was the coolest thing I have ever seen. How the, how do we do this on our own? Like, we want to do this at our school. Like, this needs to come back to MCAT. And so uh, Michael was not a foundryman at all. He was a fabricator. He was a large scale monumental sculptor. I mean, he built really big stuff on occasion um, and stuff all over the country and down into Mexico and Canada. But uh Michael was awesome. And, but he saw 
our passion for what we just saw. So he reached out and got the, the plans uh, on how to build a cupolette. And it's that same standard 100 pound cupolette that we've already talked about on uh, somebody you talked with someone else, the Cliff Prokoff 100 pound cupolette that everybody pretty much starts with. Um, it's kind of like the starter kit, I think, for iron casting. Um, and uh, we built that same furnace. Exactly. Can you give me like a, a like a what decade is this? This is the oh, this is uh 94. All right, 1994. Yeah, so I graduated high school in 91. Um, and uh, right after that, so I went into Augsburg College for two years and then I went to MCAD and started at MCAD in 93, 94, right in there. Um, and we saw the first iron pour in the in 94, I think it was with Kurt. And that was at his, where he was teaching. That's what, where he was teaching at uh, CVA, um, College of Visual Arts and, uh, or Associated Arts at that time. And they changed their name at some point. Okay. Um, but, um, so that was like 94 that we saw that. And we literally went back to school and, uh, talked to Michael and Michael was excited. We wanted to fabricate something. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, we really wanted to build this thing, but it was going to cost us money. So yeah. We um, had a, a group of people that we started at that point, a sculpture club. And there hadn't been a sculpture club at MCAD in 40 years, 30 years or something like that. So we started a sculpture club and then we went and approached the city, the, the student council because the student council had money. Mm -hmm. And so we approached the student council and uh, they said, well, we can't vote on it this week. You'll have to come back at our next meeting in two weeks. And then we, we can vote on whether we're going to give you money for this or not. And we had a certain amount that we needed to buy the steel and get the stuff thing, you know, everything done and whatever mm -hmm. and buy the refractory. And so the next time we went in there, we told all of our friends to come to the student council meeting because all the students could go and vote. Oh, nice! And so we basically railroaded through <laughs> the money to come through so we could get money to build our first furnace at MCAT. And uh, and it worked. And so we built like it wasn't even we, we saw an iron pour and within six months we built our first furnace. Wow. And, and had our own iron pour at MCAT. That's how jazzed we were about this. That's amazing. It was, it was, it's kind of crazy. And so I, I lucked out at being at MCAT at the perfect time because Michael had only been teaching there, um, not probably less than six years, I think at that point, because the college had been really, um, uh, just on a different path. They, they didn't have people there that were actually making things. It was all conceptual was all that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Michael came in to change that and make it back to a making school that you learned how to do everything by hand. Um, so that happened, but also the students that were there, uh, there was this guy, Justin Peters, one of my best friends there. And he, him and I both started in photography together and we're competing against each other. And we were both in shop class together in foundation 3d. And we were the only two kids that ever touched tools before. And so we were kind of like the two that were like, competing against each other and everybody else was kind of like just learning how to like like use a drill the right way you know <laughs> yeah yeah and so it was really fun and so and then the, we, we had a couple other people that came into it uh this guy brad hurtko and karen peters and holly and and tanya and we had this whole crew that all of a sudden just started amassing around this idea that we wanted to cast more metal that were in that first iron pour and uh the sculpture club happened and it was just unbelievable. I mean, the synergy that we had going on was amazing at that point, right? Yeah. Where um, the, it was so amazing that it scared a lot of the faculty. The faculty had never seen a group of art students band together so tightly that at, um, Michael loved making shirts. So for all the iron pours, we had shirts and different things. And Michael uh, uh, had gotten pulled into a meeting. I think this is like our junior year. And uh, the faculty were all like, oh, we're kind of like, can you like not encourage your students so much to be like, so like, can't they all just be like individuals, like most artists, like doing their thing and not be of this, like this, like this band or whatever. Well, they called us a snake pit. Like, <laughs> they actually called us Michael Bigger snake pit. So. So then you made t-shirts. He made t-shirts. And uh yeah. And so Michael like is like, I, I he goes, I, I'm not listening to any of you guys are saying. He goes, I couldn't be prouder of these kids. Good. They're actually getting, I mean, because uh while we were together as the group, uh, we got 
gallery shows and representation outside of school on our mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. uh, because of what we were doing. We were getting gigs doing that. We were doing iron pours outside of the community and different mm -hmm. things. And this is also in the beginning of this, actually in 90, was it, what year was the first year of Herman? Um, I know Herman Iron Pour came up in another one too, but the Herman Iron Pour was like a huge thing that Kurt Deerhog and Wayne Potratz and uh, a bunch of people started up in Northern Minnesota, Northwest Minnesota, middle of nowhere mm -hmm. um, and on a, in a state park. And uh, MCAD was part of that beginning also. We were there at year one and uh, we brought our furnace and Kurt brought his furnace and Wayne brought a furnace and Butch Jack at some point was up there, had a furnace and uh, uh, you name uh, Andrew Marsh and Matt Toole came up from uh, Edwardsville and brought their furnace one year. And I mean, it's like everybody at some point, I think was at Herman during that era and had a furnace there and we were casting. It was amazing. It was so much fun. Um, but uh, that was where I kind of cut my teeth on like community based, large, you know, iron pours and that. But uh, Michael, I was get back to the Sorry, the snake pit story. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna come back to that and Herman and everything. But the snake Absolutely. pit story was so funny because like literally the next week, Michael comes back with these bright pink raspberry pink shirts with bright blue image of a snake on it curled up and coming out of its thing. And it said, I survived snake pit 95 on it. It was just the best. <laughs> and, uh, and he handed us all out these shirts and we're all putting them on. He's like, you're all wearing these today and you're going to wear them for a couple of days. I don't care. And so every class we went to, we wore these shirts and the teachers would look at the shirt and see it and just shake their heads and just like, oh, he's encouraging them. Oh my God. Like, it's like, he's just pouring gasoline on us just to make it even more, you know, but Michael loved it. Good. And uh, he loved like kind of pushing the buttons within the school, but it elevated us to a level where our group just fed off of each other. Um, everybody, all of our artwork just was better. Um, and then we kind of bled into the furniture department a little too. Um, and the furniture teacher at first was a little freaked out. Uh, but then once he saw what we were doing, cause we would actually come in and they're doing very straightforward kind of furniture stuff, some really cool stuff, but we came in with more of a sculptural spin on everything and like different materials and like ways of looking at it. And it really made the other furniture guys that were like the seri more serious ones, um, push their limits also. Um, so I actually came out of MCAD with a sculpture and furniture design degree. Um, and, uh, uh, I love it. I mean, just because it's like, I end up kind of unintentionally, unintentionally making functional objects now, which is kind of part of it, but I also make a lot of furniture, um, but, uh, and also sculpture, but, uh, it was just really, uh, an epic time at that college, right place, right time and the people amazing. And the cool part about it is a lot of those people are still part of my crew that I still cast with to this day. That is incredible. That is from 90, from the mid nineties, you know, I mean, that's insane um, to still have that group. And that's how tight we were. That's, I mean, we just had just this bond that was amazing. And then um, on to like the, like I was telling you about the Herman thing, and uh, going up there and just having a blast and like meeting these artists and these sculptors from all over the country. Like they were literally coming in from all over to this little town where we just camp out, you know, for a week and hang out and, you know, swap stories and work on furnaces and, you know, pick each other's brains on what you're doing different than them. And, um, and then we started doing like these, uh, we had performance nights and, uh, you know, and actually that started actually with uh, one year, I can't remember if it was Justin or Brad forgot to bring something or, or no, it was Justin didn't bring something uh, to cast. So he walked into the woods and grabbed a log and dragged it out, had his chainsaw along, cut it in half, started carving on it. And, you know, we poured into it. But first, before we did that, everybody there was like, hell no, you're pouring. You're not pouring that. It's going to blow up. You guys are just, you guys are crazy. And we're like, no, nah, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Everybody can back way off. And we're just going to pour into this log. It's going to be fine. And uh, they really didn't want us to do it. But there was this one guy there that like uh, jumped in, this guy, John Poole, and was like, hey, if they're dumb enough to blow themselves up, let them do it. You know? Yeah, that's legit. So we put on all of our gear and everybody backed way off and we poured into these logs and they started on fire and sparking up and all this crazy stuff going on. And we're out there laughing, 
you can actually hear us out there just laughing, giggling, because we're so happy about this thing. It was really fun. And then we're like, oh, that was pretty cool. And then after we got done, they're like, that was pretty cool. Can we do that again next year? You know, and so and that was like God, that was pretty early on at Herman that we did that because that kind of became the common thing. Then we started doing things that were starting reaction casting. And uh, um, and that's actually where I started doing the rolly molds uh, with that place, too, uh, that I was like. Uh, I'd seen something fail one time. And that's one of those things where it's like learning from each other's mistakes. And I know that came up in another podcast too, but watching somebody's uh, mold fail or watching something else happen and see it and understand what went wrong and why is like such a valuable experience. But I saw somebody's mold. They did a giant penguin out of styrofoam. And the thing was like two foot tall. Okay. Um, and they poured it with the beak down and the feet at the top. And uh, they did not put enough sand all the way around it. They did like less than a two inch and it was sodium silicate, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, it just, they didn't, ha- they didn't leave the flask on it, which that a lot of times will help it uh, survive that, but poured into it and it was sitting there and the mold was perfect. And all of a sudden, about 30 seconds later, the mold just goes, ah. Splits perfectly in half down oh. the side wings of the bird and, and the head stayed together, but the feet were split and the rest of the body was split in half huh. and it had had a candy shell of a oh. cat because it had hit the sand, yeah. chilled, yeah. but the core, the soft candy core was still molten and that's what gave way, but there was still a casting there um, and the head was perfect. It was just the body and the feet were like split, like somebody taking a cleaver and like cut this thing in half. And I was like, that's so cool. And I was like, huh, how can I purposefully do something like that where I get a candy shell without having to cast a core? Yeah. Hmm. So I started kicking it around, no pun intended, because yeah. I didn't really do that. Um, it was actually intended. I've, I've used that joke <laughs> <laughs> okay we'll go on record <laughs> but i literally the first one i did i literally like uh was at herman and i didn't know the only people i told and it was a performance night where we're pouring things that were doing some crazy stuff yeah um and uh i literally like told only my two buddies justin and brad i'm like i'm gonna pour metal in this thing then i'm gonna kick it over and i'm gonna kick it down the parking lot and then i'm gonna kick it back down the parking lot the opposite way maybe a couple times And I did that with two molds. And the first time I did it, everybody was freaking out. They thought I lost my, they thought I lost my marbles and like, we're like, what in the hell is he doing? And uh, the next day when I popped the molds open and showed them the final castings, they were just like, oh, whoa, wow. Cause the first one I did turned out looking like lace, like I'd cast lace um, in the shape of of this vessel that I'd done where I'd taken a couple of styrofoam balls, mm-hmm. stacked them and cut them and, and put them together in this uh, kind of a traditional uh, Greek vase. And then I'd, I'd taken low melt hot glue and drew on it um, details around the outside that were similar to a Greek vase. And, uh, and that was the, the form in with, a, with uh, the sand cast around it with a sauna tube, a concrete form tube around the outside of that. Okay. And so I knew I was going to be rough with this thing and I needed it to hold together and keeping the form on the outside was the key to not breaking down and getting destroyed, like the penguin cracking open. So if I didn't have enough sand, at least that form is still there holding it. Uh, but I also overdid the sand on it too, because I knew I was going to be kicking it around. Yeah. Um, but, uh, oh my God, it was so cool seeing the faces the next day when I showed them the work that I pulled out of this thing and everybody was like, oh you just made a hollow form yeah, with something without a core and in a way that was spectacular, you know, I was like, okay, I get it. And so then since then I've been playing with that idea, you know, I've, I've done, I've cast into pretty much most things you could ever think of uh, from wicker baskets Mm -hmm. that have completely burned out to inside of glass vessels. Some that I've actually uh, bought in like dollar store vases to like uh, absolute bottles and whiskey bottles and different things like that, that you happen to find around, uh, you know, like uh, party sites. Uh, I'll take the cool looking bottles that have really cool designs and like cast into them and roll them around and pour out the metal. And that's, you know, that that's what it comes uh, is these cool pieces that are these rolly molds. Um, and, I, and they end up coming out with holes and voids and negative spaces that you just can't predict any other way. And I love that about them. And so I started calling them artifacts. 
Yeah. They look ancient and old. Like there's a story there already. What is the um, kind of at this point in your career, what is the draw with the iron and keeping the iron in your artistic practice? Um, God, in the beginning, I just uh, I was just enamored by it. It was just like, how does this work? Because I was um, the fortunate yet unfortunate thing was when we learned how to cast iron, because Michael wasn't was a fabricator and not an iron caster. Um, we didn't really have anyone around us telling us what to do or not do. Yeah. And, uh, um, we didn't have people around us, uh, explaining how to like light a furnace for the first time. <clears throat> so the first time we lit our furnace, we had the lid down on a cupolette. Not a good idea. We almost tipped the thing over when we lit it because yeah. the gas built up in it and, and it had the, the torch on it and the lid popped open and almost took the whole furnace over with and it came back down and slammed the lid down. And we we're like, oh, okay, note to self. <laughs> don't leave the lid shut when you're actually lighting it. When you're when you're burning burning in. When you're burning in. Yeah. 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 Oh. And so like we literally had to go through all of our growing pains on uh furnaces. <laughs> by ourselves for the most part. We had this guy, John Poole, that worked at a major foundry would come in on occasion and help us out a little bit. And I mean, really got us along the way. But for the most part, when we'd go to these other pours and watch everybody else, we were literally like taking mental notes because we're like, we kind of don't know what we're doing. Um, so I learned how to cast iron by doing everything wrong. And like, literally like failing so much and doing stupid shit and not knowing it was stupid shit. But then we also um did a lot of stuff too where we were uh pushing the boundaries on things and not knowing it but we were weren't told we couldn't do things so mm -hmm. we just did things like pouring into logs and you know pouring into molds and rolling them around on the ground because i thought that would be cool and it might look cool and you know and i, I that's what i wanted to make the art out of and how i wanted to do it you know and uh, michael was like okay yeah yeah sounds good you know and he just didn't know so we had we had nobody there telling us we couldn't do something. Yeah. And that was like a great way to learn, kind of terrifying at times. Yeah. It's like a, a bunch of unsupervised toddlers. Like you weren't toddlers, but that's probably kind of what it could be Yeah, related to. It's just, well, we don't know what's wrong. So we're just going to do everything and we'll figure it out. Yep. And you did. And I also do feel like sometimes when you learn a lesson from doing the wrong thing, you learn it twice as well as if you were just told how to do it the first time, because you don't know, well, this is how you do it, but I don't necessarily know the background of why. Yep. I, I completely agree on that. And that's where um, I will never tell anybody you can't do something because of this, that, or the other. I will tell them in my experience, when I've tried that, this is what happened. Yeah. And if it's not life-threatening kind of stuff, I will say you should still try it because you never know what'll happen. Cause I've had people tell me, Oh, you can't do that. That's not going to work. And then I go do it because that's actually a challenge to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I go and do it and I make it work and then I'll come back to them and show it to them and be like, you know, that thing you told me doesn't work. Well, Hey, take a look at this. This totally worked. Yeah. And it's awesome. <laughs> you know? So for me, it's a challenge when somebody says, Oh, you can't do that. That doesn't work. I'm like, Oh, you want to bet. And then you have that experience under your belt. Yep. So where, so where do you go from, from there? Herman was like this uh, amazing, just like, uh, you know, learning grounds of like the community thing. Cause every time we'd go there, we actually left behind a community sculpture mm -hmm. that the community would come in and make something and do these things. And, uh, and we would help facilitate that. And I ended up being like a really good fabricator. So I'd actually help build some of the stuff and the things that they were building on site. Um, um, the forms that they were mounting things in and, um, and, and then we eventually actually built one big furnace for Herman and I helped out with building that. Um, and then we had also, I don't know what, where it came up. We had one performance night where we actually built uh, a crazy experimental furnace that my buddy and I came up with called the slam dunk furnace. Um, that was really bizarre and really fun. And, uh, the crazy part, the end part of this story was, well, maybe you'll tell it in the Scotland one too. But when I was at George Beasley's place in Scotland, he had a photo of this furnace on his wall. There was four photos above his drawing table uh -huh. in Scotland. 
And one of the four photos when I was in his face and I look up and I'm like, holy crap, that's me ah. standing next to my crazy slam dunk furnace. One of four photos and in his thing. And I was like, so honored. I was like, George, do you know what that is? He said, oh yeah, Wayne sent that to me years ago. And I pull it down. I was like, Wayne, that's me. Or uh, George, I was like, yeah. George, that's me. And we built this furnace that basically uh, it was for the five-year anniversary at Herman. Okay. And it was a, a furnace that had no tap hole, only had a, a one tweer blower on it, um, and uh, was a small cylinder. It was like uh, maybe like a twelve-inch, maybe. Okay. Um, and uh, and we built these giant handled rings on it, and had it on a pivot point, and had it so we would actually, when the furnace was ready, we just dump the whole furnace over, coke and all, into a trough, and all the metal and and the coke would get stuck stuck on the trough and okay. then the metal would go down the trough and fill a mold at the end of the trough that was laying at the end of it. Um, and, uh, it was awesome. <laughs> that sounds insane and amazing. It was very cool. And it was just like, one of those things was like, at the time we're like, Oh yeah, this is totally. And it totally did work. I mean, like yeah. we literally had out exactly the right amount of metal and we had this logo of, uh, the year five logo of, yeah. uh, and we overthought it and we accidentally did it backwards. So then we ended up using it as a brand. Um, oh, but yeah. Was, yeah. You know that we planned that. No, of course. But we actually did backwards. <laughs> um, overthinking it. But uh, it was just- I mean, you can only do so much when you're making an experimental furnace, like the, the end product being backwards. It seems nominal compared to it working. It worked. Yeah. Yeah. And we had literally um, we'd actually take made a wood trough and then lined it with um um like a furnace patch basically yeah uh, and so it would slick out and go down and everything and um yeah, and we and it took four people two on each side to grab these giant rings and like literally tip this whole furnace over it was about a was it a four foot tall furnace It was only about a four foot tall okay. furnace 12 inch bore so it wasn't huge but it was heavy with all with coke and iron and yeah. everything in there and getting it to tip fully over mm-hmm. but and then it just tipped over and dumped into the trough filled up the trough and the iron rolled all the way to the end and dumped into this mold. And it was, it, and it, it literally was just enough to fill the mold. So it was like, did you just run it that, or did you re refill it and run it again? Or was it just one and done? One, one and done slam dunk. It was it. Oh, that's why it's called slam dunk. Yeah. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> that's yeah. so good. I love people's furnace names because sometimes it's a, a slow realization, but that sounds awesome. Yeah. So we started building weird furnaces pretty early in our career too. So it was like, all right, we want to do something different. You know, what's going to happen if we do this? But we also saw, I think that was around the time Butch Jack probably had came up with his trash can furnace. And that was like, are you kidding me? The guy just went to the hardware store and bought a trash can, a metal trash can. Have you ever seen it? No, tell me, tell me everything. Oh my God. He, he, he would show up with a trash can from Ace Hardware that was like, you know, like the ones that are like uh, 36 inches tall or whatever, 30, 36 inches tall. Yeah. And uh, he would have refractory. Um, and then he'd buy like one of the little uh, pails that's about this big and uh, line that too. And that would be his ladle. Okay. Like a metal pail. Yeah. Little mm-hmm. metal pail that he'd get. So he'd buy everything from Ace Hardware and the different parts and the steel pipes that he needs to put in and inlets and everything. And I think he had a blower he carried along too, but it was just like, are you, he just bought everything out of the store and just built this furnace. And we took all this time and all this other stuff. And, you know, it was crazy. And I was like, that is so cool. I love it. You know, yeah. trash can furnace. It was just like, it was bonkers. So that was like, early on, like seeing that I was like, Oh God, you can build furnaces out of a lot of cool things, you know? Um, so, you know, that really helped me kind of like start seeing things, but at Herman, it was great because we were being, uh, influenced by so many different people early on in our career, you know, and, uh, or, and it was just, you know, it just really showed me different ways. And, and when we had problems, I, I remember one time, uh, uh, first time we had metal come out the bottom of the furnace because, uh, somebody had poked, too much down yeah. when they were tapping the furnace and didn't realize they were doing it. Cause you can't, you don't want to do that. You always want to tap up yeah. you're going up into the furnace and uh, breach the bottom. And uh, so I basically had a, uh, a plywood board that we'd throw in a bunch of like furnace patch on yeah. and I'm like sitting under the furnace, holding this Oh my gosh! while it's sitting up 
and somebody had ran and got a car jack and a two by four and put under there and jacked it up and got it to hold into place. So I didn't have to hold on to it anymore. So we could finish the iron pour because we didn't want to quit. <laughs> Just thinking on your feet. Yeah. And so adaptability and, uh, and, and, and just being able to like flow with the moment, you know, just being like, how do we keep this going? And that has actually served me so well. Cause I've had, I've had many furnaces along the way where something weird happened and that's going to inevitably happen to all of us. Oh yeah. Yeah. And iron pours where like the bottom starts leaking or you get a hole in the side or you get something going on and you're like, well, how do we do this? Do we need to shut down? Mm-hmm. If we, is there a way to still make this work? I had uh, a pour one time where somebody uh, that was used to working in a foundry, but they were working in a foundry that didn't use Coke. And they said, charge the furnace. And the guy charged the furnace full of iron and no Coke between the layers. Oh, oh dear. Um, and so I had to like adapt and figure out how to make that furnace still run with, and, and actually I went up on top and got as much iron out of it as I could. Um, yeah. Lots of small fines and lots of small Coke went in right away. Mm-hmm. Get really hot and keep it going and tapping pretty quickly too. So it wasn't sitting in the base too long, but, uh, but like just thinking on your feet and being able to be like, uh, th- this makes sense. We do this you know, and not just dropping bottom and starting over. Cause that just takes so much energy and so much time. Yeah. I hate that. <laughs> I hate wasting materials. So I'm like, I gotta make this work. Yeah. If you can save it, try and save it. And so this is Herman and this is post. So you graduate from college and you're still pouring in Herman. Yeah. Um, graduated. Um, well, okay. So we started there in 94 and it went till, 2005, I think Herman went. Okay. Because it went 11 years, uh, 2004 or five, somewhere in there, uh, Herman lasted. And um, it was just great. It was really fun. Just, you know, it was a, 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 we'd get together and, you know, camp out and meet all these people. And, you know, a lot of it too was making these friendships along the way too that became lifelong friendships. Like, I'm not sure when Andrew and Tool were there, but because of them coming there and meeting, Later, I met them when they were in, um, I met Andrew again, eventually when we were in, um, I went to Lexington to hang out a little bit. Um, and, uh, and then just kept bumping into him throughout the years. And, um, I've stayed at his place and he's just an amazing, um, really awesome artist that I really enjoy hanging out. Oh yeah. And then, uh, uh, the Western cast iron conference, I got to actually, uh, him and I were like uh, part of the performance crew with some crazy things. And I think somebody was just talking about that too, about the, uh, uh, the performance stuff or that Andrew was talking about, uh, the performance stuff he was doing there, yeah, uh, cutting the logs up and then having the, the log shooting across. And I'm in the middle with my thunder boxes and they're blowing up and kicking molds around. And then, uh, Rian's got the, the, I think she had the, the cul-de-sac of burning little houses made out of like some cardboard and corn and stuff. I think it was, it was like, it was a really fun time. And then it, there was a, a tornado in the next County over and we had hail and that was, a was this in time. Hayes? Was this yeah. in Hayes, Kansas? Yeah, that in Hayes. Yeah. So that's, that was the first kind of like pour that I went to that. Well, no, that's a lie, but that was the first big like group conference that I yeah. went to after sloss. And yeah. I do feel like, like sloss has a lot of structure which I, I feel like it needs to have that infrastructure for them to be able to do an event like that in, yep. in that location. But yeah, there's something about the Western that I love the Western it's like just a little bit more fast and loose. Yep. And I feel like it, that's beautiful in its own way, you yep. know? And so it's like every single iron pour or iron conference I go to, I feel like each one has something a little bit different to offer and that makes it kind yep. of more exciting. Yeah. And so, so I want to know, how do we get from here to your farm? <laughs> um, well, um, Herman and my farm overlapped, uh, two years, um, okay. because I saw, cause I was helping run Herman the last five years. Um, yeah. me and my crew were kind of took it over and we're the ones helping make sure it kept running. Um, yeah. and, uh, that was like amazing. But, uh, the last two years, I, you know, we, we knew the rumblings that the town was kind of done with uh, doing it. They were kind of like to a point where they're like, all right, we've done this long enough, you know, and I kind of knew that was coming. 
Mm-hmm. And it also happened to be right at the time where um, um, I was that oh, man, there was like uh, right after college for five years, I, I, I got into the industry of uh, building uh, large scale props uh, and, and fabrication and that. So when I left college, uh, Michael had gotten me a job at a fab company building uh, the mushrooms for the rainforest cafes. Um, <laughs> That's great. So like 19 foot mushrooms on the outside and, uh, and uh, 42 foot mushrooms over the whole bar area and everything. And, uh, and so I was like in just building these crazy when all the different little parts that went to it. And then um, literally, what are they, what are they made out of? Are they fiberglass? Well, they're steel with a fiberglass skin. Okay. Yeah. So there's actually a really amazing steel structure underneath there that uh, we would fabricate and uh, it would be a lot of drilling, a lot of like a lot of fabbing little individual parts together that are individual, like the shape of a Uh mushroom, um, like one piece. And then you'd like bolt all these pieces together and they would all create the full round of a mushroom. Um, it was crazy, but, uh, I got to like learn how to fabricate on a level that was like insane. And I had to, and I got to be surrounded by a couple old, uh, older, um, uh, one of them was a, quite a, you know, 20 years older than I was. And the other guy was maybe less than 10 yeah. uh, years older than me, but, uh, had been out fabricating. And one of them, uh, Rollin actually was, uh, had worked for, um, De Suvero for a little bit too. So like wow. getting to hear yeah. stories about that. And, um, but, uh, these guys took me under their wing and like taught me how to like be a better fabricator and a better mm-hmm. builder and like how to think about the projects. And so I was like, um, really man, learning how to fab at that level right out of college. I mean, cause I already knew mm-hmm. how to weld, but I, I learned how to weld a lot better yeah. and also how to build. So they didn't have anybody that was willing to go out on the road and install these things. And, uh, they're like, Hey, you want to go on the road? So like my first road job, I go out and I'm like the lead. Oh, wow. Like at 25, I'm like running a crew, but I'm dealing with all the general contractors and the, uh, the other heads, um, that are all older guys that are 20 years older. And I, and I'm trying to tell them what I need from them. And they're like trying to bulldoze over me. And I'm like, no, you ain't doing that. Um, and so I had to really like develop a, a new skill set of like how to deal with people in control or that want control and also want to control you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, but it was, it was really interesting and really fun, but I got to travel all over the United States, uh, installing mushrooms and, uh, and, and the company had these hats that said, we do mushrooms on them. I found that's a bad hat to wear through the airport going to, going to work, <laughs> not a good hat to wear bad idea. <laughs> might be sending not the right no message, message. For, no, no. I'm for, like, <laughs> for that pla- for that arena yeah, yeah, not, not the best not the best <laughs> <laughs> so uh um so I did that and then one of the last big projects I did for that company I mean, I was all over the United States because of the, that one but uh, the one of my favorites was is uh if you've ever been to Knoxville Tennessee and seen the uh, women's basketball hall of fame there's a giant 27 foot diameter basketball the end of the basketball hall of fame at uh, that, that crew helped build. And then I was on site. I helped build uh, a lot of the steel work and the fiberglass work on that. And then, um, we were on site for five weeks building it Wow! on site. And it's a basketball falling through the hoop at the end of the building. And that, that was pretty epic. That was really fun. But, uh, I kind of just got burnt out at that point, um, and, uh, needed a change. So, um, I was looking for something different and I, I wanted to do similar work, but I didn't want to travel anymore. Cause I just like, when I f- first started that job, I just met my future wife mm-hmm. and uh, it was like traveling and I was calling her. I think the first two year and a half, I knew her, we saw each other maybe like six or seven months just because I was on the road three, four weeks at a time and living in hotels yeah. and bombing all over. But uh, so I took a job at another company that did the same thing, except for, all their stuff was going in Times Square and like Sunset Strip and Caracas, Venezuela. And like they're building giant three-dimensional billboards. Mm-hmm. And so um, the fab work I was doing was like really like captivating to me. And, and it was really a good thing for me because it was re- um, helped me refine my craft mm-hmm. um, around that area. 
and uh and i and i just love that part of it um but it also took me away from making my own art because when i'd come home i the last thing i wanted to do was make art so the only thing i had that was still creative at that time that i was doing was still going to iron pours on a regular basis and so i was still going to iron pours and i didn't always make a piece of artwork but i was always right on the furnace and i was learning how to run that furnace that was like my my goal was to get better at furnace operation and learn how to be the best at that I could be. Um, and so that was the art form that I was really kind of like honing at that point, I guess. Yeah. Um, and building furnaces. I was still kind of in the process of building some too. So um, that was like, you know, the being able to, well, I, because of the jobs I was doing, I was way better fabricator at that point mm -hmm. too. Uh, than when I built that first furnace, but uh, that was like amazing. And these other jobs were amazing, but uh I ended up having to, uh, 9 11 happened, um, and everything I was building in Times Square just quit. And that was 2001, you know? Uh, wow. And, uh, yeah. Because all the, of the billboards we were building, like we built a giant 26 foot diameter earth in Times Square that we did, a giant 40 foot lava lamp that had mechanical working bubbles in it. And like, it was just really cool stuff that we were building and i absolutely loved it and i was a lead uh welder at that point and like running the shop and ordering the steel and mm -hmm. learning how to like manage and run stuff you know which for me at that point was really really important and it you know and development but i wasn't really making art either at that time either um but i still was casting iron and at that same point it was somewhere in there um i was building a house from the ground up that was my other art form um, had 20 acres out in the country, building a house, had my dream job. Everything is going great. 9-11 happens, lose my job, oh. trying to build the house with, uh, on, on basically nothing. Um, cause I don't have a job. So I was hustling around. I worked for a blacksmith a little bit. I worked for a flooring company. I sold cars for a little while. I mean, I was doing whatever I could to try to keep this house. But at that same point about uh, just before all that happened, my mom was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's. And, uh, uh, so she was starting to decline in a way that my dad wasn't able to take care of her as much. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, and we couldn't, we were having a hard time keeping the house. We sold the house and the land and everything that we literally, I, I claimed the wood for the lumber in that house, you know, and like yeah. made all the, you know, like we built that house from the ground up. The only thing I didn't do was the stick frame and the siding. We like put the foundation in, we, wow. uh, all the wood trim did the, the roof, the, you know, like everything. the drywall, everything, the wiring, yeah. I wired the place. Actually, my wife helped actually wire. She read a book and then we, we wired it together, <laughs> Yeah, but it was really awesome. So it was really kind of a cool place, but then, uh, we just couldn't do it, but it was a blessing in disguise because it forced me to move back home, uh, to the farm. And, uh, we were able to take care of my mom for the last nine months of her life, wow. a little over nine months, but, uh, yeah. um, it was amazing. But while I was there, I was like, I'm home, I'm going to build a furnace and I'm going to have an iron pour here. And so that's the beginning of the down on the farm. And wow. we still had Herman going, but yeah. I knew Herman was not going to last much longer. So I yeah. was kind of like, this will be the new Herman. Basically. I was actually going to yeah. call it that. Um, um, because actually my, my grandfather's mother's maiden name is Herman, actually. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't have been too far off. Yeah. Could have, been, could have, could have worked. But uh, instead, I call it down on the farm because that's just what everybody, everybody, when they'd call me out, they're like, hey, you having that thing down on the farm? You know, and that's kind of how the name came about was everybody, when they'd call me, would say, we having that thing down on the farm. And I'm like, yeah, I'm having that. Um, so I decided to have that first pour and, uh, and it, you know, worked out. But my mom passed away five days before the pour. Oh, uh, and the I'm funeral sorry. ended up being on Thursday uh, yeah. and the iron pour was on Saturday. And I just basically, it was so amazing because the furnace was still being built. So my friends yeah. came in and helped finish building the furnace and did everything. And they were all like, are you sure? I was like, my mom wouldn't want me to postpone this. She knows how much this means to me. Yeah. And uh, my family has never seen what I do. Yeah. Uh, so this would be a great opportunity. And then this way we can make some memorial plaques for my mom and my family can make stuff that they can take away. Yeah. And my friends who were my family at that point also were there uh, supporting me greatly, um, which is pretty amazing. And we know how the iron community is with the, with family um, as a family. Yeah. As I see it, you know, um, um, I have blood family, but I also have the iron family and yeah. iron in my blood. So they're family. <laughs> 
And uh, so it was just this weird, like timing of everything. But the farm pour kind of started out of a necessity to move home, but also to take care of my mom. So whenever I have the iron pour now, it's this thing where it's it always reminds me of my mom. Um, and this thing where she was there, but she was the one that got me into art school, which then got me yeah. into iron casting, which then iron casting brought me to the farm, fine, you know, eventually getting it to do there. And so there's, you know, I still have these, you know, it, it brings fond memories and, and good memories of, of that still, even though it was, it's sad and, and, and heartbreaking and part of life. It's just, it's part of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, don't know. I mean, in art and in life, there are contradictory tendencies and feelings and to be able to lean into all of them, even if they are happy and sad at the same time, I think that that's a, a gift that we can experience. So, and, and that's, I just got goosebumps listening to you talk about that story. And, and so then how has it evolved? Because I think, so when was that in the early 2000s? 2004. So how has it evolved? From, from 2004, was it fairly small? Were there very small? Uh, probably, probably about 20, maybe 20 some people, maybe it was 20, 24 people. And that was pretty small. It was basically my base crew that when we'd go out and do iron pours, um, public iron pours, because we actually had something um, early on. There was another foundry group that uh, I was part of early on that was a nonprofit. Um, called Foundry Education and Fine Arts, where we were going around and we were doing county fairs, we were doing street festivals, we were just all summer running around casting iron in the weirdest places. And, you know, and and, and by this time we'd built, uh, I think we were under like three or four furnaces um, mm -hmm. that were different. And every time, you know, from like uh, um, the first one being the standard hundred pound cupolette, then we went mm -hmm. to uh, a cupola uh, that had a single tweer on it, a uh, only like a 10 inch. No, it was more than a 10 inch. It was a 12 inch bore, but a mm -hmm. single tweer on it. And then we built another one and actually put a dual tangential tweers on it. Okay. And then uh, we went back to actually getting a wind belt on it. And then the wind belt one is the one that we have now today. That's actually a hot rod. We call it. And that thing's insane. That thing cooks fast. I mean, it lights up fast. You can literally like be doing 80 pounds of iron um, in under an hour from the time you put a torch on it. Wow. And under an hour, I mean, it burns in in a half an hour and you're at, you're, you got, you're at blast in a half an hour. And then uh, in 45 minutes, you've already got basically metal going in. And, uh, and then it's every eight minute, it's eight minute taps for 80 pounds. And then it, wow. it just cooks along. It's, it's and that's what you're, you're doing right now. The same furnace. That's my little furnace. Yeah. That's the little okay. furnace. And then we have a bigger furnace that uh, friends of ours built um, okay. that were uh, uh, influenced by us. And uh, that thing does every four minutes, hundred pounds, but it's a big furnace. It's like a 24 inch bore and mm -hmm. like uh, 12 feet tall. It's huge. Wow. Uh, and uh, that one's, that, that's the one that we run on the farm now because it just gets a pour done fast. Yeah. <laughs> You're in and out pretty quickly in that. Um, and I've never been really big on, um, I know a lot of people building like bigger furnaces that you know, are doing thousand pound taps. And I'm like, you know, to like make something like that, you got to have rolling gantries and you got to have all yeah. this extra stuff around. And I've always been a big fan of like, if I can't put it up with a couple of guys uh, yeah. on the portable side, you know, I mm -hmm. don't want to really do it. You know, I, I, I want it still portable enough. I want it so I can grab a ladle and go pour it and not have to yeah. worry about it, you know? So I've always been more on that side. I know plenty of people that have big furnaces and if I want to yeah. pour something, I can do it, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, for me, it's just always been more about portability and, and, and the ability to not have to use a forklift, a crane, whatever. So the furnaces I've been building have all been adapted to that, basically. Mm -hmm. More accessible to... More accessible, yeah. Yeah, just human labor and not, um, like you were yeah. mentioning, all of the mechanical um, things that other people, yeah. And I think that there's lots of different people that have different furnaces for different reasons. Yep. So the, you know, and I have, I have people asking me, well, when do you want to build a furnace? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to have, I go, I go to my friend's house. Yep. Do you want to talk more about the far, like down on the farm poor? And yeah, I mean, uh, the down on the farm is now, um, it's, it's evolved over the years. In the beginning, it was a, 
we were doing enough iron pours that we wanted to like pay back our crew. So we started out with doing this pour to give the crew a chance to make something more than just one piece. Mm -hmm. um, whereas on the, when we were doing like road crew stuff and they'd come out and help us pour, um, they'd get to make one piece and it wouldn't be very big and whatever yeah. the, the farm pour, we could actually make multiple pieces and it was just dedicated to the crew coming in and making stuff. Well, word got out and the crew kind of got a little bigger and all of a sudden it just, and then I started traveling a lot more too. That was a big part of my, um, after I left college, actually, when I got back into it, after I started building my own furnace, actually, yeah, that's actually when it happened. When down on the farm started, I started traveling more in 2003 to 2004, I made it my mission to go meet all the gray beards, basically. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, find them and learn more from them. And so that's when I started hitting um, sloths and, um, um, and going out and cause some of these guys had already met a bunch because of Herman, but, uh, yeah. like I hadn't met George Beasley yet at that point. Mm -hmm. So I made it a mission to go down there and I went to Georgia state and, mm -hmm. uh, two years in a row poured with him. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, and I got to meet guy at, uh, you know, and yeah. with him at a time. And then that's, uh, you know, heart goes out to them. Um, and I, I you know, such a cool individual and, uh, just love chatting with him. Uh, yeah. also, uh, you know, heart goes out to Dan Hunt's family right now who just passed away. Also, who's another amazing iron caster. Um, he let, he showed me in, uh, the first time I'd ever seen a continuous tap furnace. I'd never seen that Yeah, and, uh, being able to see that and that, uh, how they run it and how it's different, but yet, you know, has its, has its benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that, and I was just really fun and, um, uh, great teacher. You know, I just yeah. really enjoyed the time spent um, there. And uh, I just uh, I just made it my mission to go around and meet as many people and glean as much knowledge as possible off everybody. And it was so fun because when I first went to like Sloss, nobody knew who I was. I literally walked around and it was like, like I knew nothing. And at that point, I'd already been casting for um, 10 years. Yeah. I'd already been casting for 10 years at that point, but most people hadn't, I, 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 I wasn't out that much. And most people didn't, I mean, there was a few people, few people knew who I was. Yeah. I walked around and I was like, Hey, what are you guys doing? What's going on here? Is this some kind of like metal thing? You know, <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> you put on an act. And, uh, and uh, it was funny because then the students would be talking to me and not knowing who I was. And then yeah. like the professor would come up who I'd seen at Herman or whatever, like, Hey Kelly, how's it going? And they'd be like, look at me and they're like, Oh, <laughs> you maybe do know what you're talking about, you know, but I'm, I, but I'm like, I'm curious how you guys do it because yeah. I know how I do it, you know? Um, but I want to know more, you know? So yeah. I made it a mission to go around and learn how everybody else did it and their techniques. And why would you have a, tr a square ladle and then turn it 90 and make, Oh, that's cool. It's a diamond shape. So it's a poor mm -hmm. spot on both sides. Mm -hmm. I love that. You know, I mean, I haven't done that yet on any of mine, but I get the, the, the idea behind it. And I thought it was really cool. You know, um, I'm not sure who did that first, but props to you for doing it. Cause I, it was a cool idea. I liked it. Um, but, um, just, it was really fun. So I like, uh, you know, going to Sloss really opened my mind up to a lot of new stuff too, uh, yeah. that I'd never seen before. And it was just really fun. And, um, you know, went to, uh, Western iron conference and I got invited out to, uh, actually the, when I went to Hayes, that was, uh, I got invited out by them to come out because of Chris Meyer and those guys and, and, uh, had, uh, I can't remember where they met me, but they met me somewhere along the way. And they're like, you need to come out and do what you're doing and do this crazy thunder box thing you're doing. I don't know what it is, but it's awesome. And that's the stacked layer plywood uh, box that I make with forms on the inside that are negative spaces. And um, you just keep pouring in them until they just don't take metal anymore. But I'm, they're always spitting and sparking and throwing mm -hmm. fireballs up and that. And, uh, and I like making ancient like structures like pyramids and temples and wa anchor wad. I got one that's in the shape of that. And, um, and I just really enjoyed that. And so I got to meet these just amazing human beings, just walking around and learning and just asking questions. And that first year I went to, um, Sloss, I was on a furnace with, uh, um, Georgia state, Florida state. Um, I think there was a, I can't remember. There was some other, like I was on four different furnaces that week. Wow. Uh, Cause I just kept walking around. Hey, you guys need to help. I'll break iron or Coke or uh, help you. Where do you need help? You know? And so I just walked around all the different ones and just jumped into crews 
and just floated around like a butterfly to crew to crew. And it was awesome. It was so much fun. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just what I always, whenever I tell people their first time going to Sloss, just do that. Just yeah. the best thing you could do the, the first time, uh, Gwen, uh, uh from Chicago, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Gwen Chu went down there. Um, I told her, I was like, just walk up to people and say, how can I help? Yeah. And, 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 you know, what do you need? Uh, I, can I assist or do you need me to get you something or whatever? And you will get into a crew and you're going to find more poor crews than you care to think about, you know, and it's going to be great because they all do it differently. And it's really fun to watch, you know? Um, And that's usually my advice for new uh, people coming into this. Just walk into a place, say, do you guys need a hand? Can I help? Yeah. And just see what you can see and learn what you can learn. That's yeah. So I want to, I want to, talk more about the down on the farm though, because that's coming up. So I think that now is the time in the show where we should just, because I feel like you've been ramping up over the past couple of years, ramping up social media coverage. It's been growing. It's been growing. It's going to be bigger this year than it's ever been before. It's going to be amazing. Um, so yes, this last couple of years, I mean, up to this point, I've been like running it kind of like on my, I mean, I've been like setting up the media and setting up all the stuff and, and getting the word out and like uh, doing all that. And this last year I had a group of people come to me and say, we want to help you make it better. Um, Cause we see you struggling with this now because I was really wiping me out. Um, and so uh, this group came up and we've been having um, uh, monthly meetings and talking about it and how to make the food and the catering the food, basically we not, catered. I mean, we have a full on-site kitchen staff. That's amazing. Making the best food. Um, we have a whole sand studio crew that is just helping make all the sand. So the same people are, you know, running the mixers and doing all the stuff and there for also helping you learn how to make a sand mold. If you've never done it before, um, and if I need to jump in and like give better, you know, a little more in depth on stuff, I can do that, but it also allows me to start floating around and be kind of everywhere at the same time and help in different places um, that need it. So it's just gotten to be so much better. And this year uh, we got some really cool, we got a sand sponsor this year, which is going to be really nice. One of the local foundries is stepping up um, that I've worked with in the past, doing some uh, community casting projects with them and some uh, high school kids I did in the past. And they love that I'm, you know, education and foundry and that kind of stuff going on. So that's been really nice. And then, um, um what else we got a beer sponsor this year we actually got a microbrewery in the area that's actually stepping up and uh helping us out with some beers that's uh, exciting because uh, people get thirsty and i'm gonna have root beer there too that don't drink and then i'm also might even have some cider too for those that are gluten-free so it's a little bit of everything and then um yeah the and then the sand studio we are is just, you know, we're getting that better. We got a muller this year that will be able to do 300 pounds because we've been working out of a hundred pound sand mixer forever. And, but we make just like a cement mixer, cement mixer, hundred pound cement mixer. And it totally works. You can do it, but it's, it's just a little more time and you need to plan out your molds a little better. Yeah. So, you know, and then if you get a crew where they're just like on it, like mixing one right after another, after another, you can like do pretty decent sized molds. Um, This 300 pounder is going to really make a big difference on us this year. We're pretty excited yeah. about that. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just getting better. we got a bluegrass band playing on Friday night. That'll be real fun. And then Saturday, we're going to be just lighting up the furnace late afternoon. We always do late afternoon, early evening, because we always end out uh, the evening and the last uh, few taps are usually pyro pieces. And Chris mm-hmm. Meyer usually shows up with some pretty awesome pieces and his, <sighs> And then Jordan Eaton and uh, yeah, a few yeah. of us that are, and I usually have some uh, pyro ones with my stuff and a uh, buddy of mine, John Bradley, usually has some weird experimental stuff that he's playing with. And um, it's just, it's just a fun time. Well, let's just, cause this is, this episode is going to go out like, cons- like a few weeks before your event. Yep. So for everybody that's listening. Let's just lay it out. Let's just, cause people can still sign up to come, right? We can still sign up to come. So um, let's give specifics like the dates, the, what are they? If you are coming, um, we like to get people there as early as possible. And we are starting to set up basically on that where people can show up either on uh, Tuesday, the 28th of June, mm-hmm. that you could come as early as that. But most people are coming on, on Wednesday, the 29th. And Sand Studio is basically open 
and going so you can make stuff. And that's going to go all the way through to Friday night at midnight. And at Friday night at midnight, Sand Studio stops. Okay. So that we then have all of Saturday morning and afternoon to, to open molds, pull out, put back together, button them up, yeah. get them out on the pour floor. Because then the furnaces light up on Saturday at uh, like pretty much right around about five o'clock. We usually light up and then by a little after by 630, we're pouring metal and it'll only go till about nine, 930. But this furnace kicks metal out pretty quickly. Yeah. So we'll pour for like three, four, three hours and that and we'll be done. And uh, um, Thursday night, though, uh, we do have an art show that's going to be uh, in town decora mm -hmm. where it's going to be um, I'm, I've got about I'm going to have about 12 to 15 pieces from the last 18 years of iron casting at the farm. So it has to be a piece that's been made at the farm. And uh, Alyssa Toninato has her uh, uh, cast iron frying skillet of Annie Oakley. Uh, it's a waffle iron. It's a waffle iron uh, with Annie Oakley image in it that we cast very early on back in the day. So that's going to be really fun having her out, her piece there. And I've got, uh, there's going to be some really neat pieces in there from like pieces that are styro, uh, because that, that's one of those areas that I've I delved into for a while doing a, a evaporative polystyrene and playing with different types of styrofoams and also getting different textures out of styrofoams from different applications that I've done to them. Um, it's, and that's the fun part about it is uh, I literally have people there that teach foundry and, you know, college that are professors. Yeah. Um, uh, this year I might actually have a guy there that is uh, the guy that is donating them or letting me have the Muller there yeah. teaches at UW Platteville in the metallurgy foundry program and UW Platteville, Wisconsin. Okay. That, that his job, the people that he trains goes out and works in major big foundries all over the country. So it's like uh, a dust industrial foundry, industrial okay. foundry education and that, and his knowledge is like, they're like, and then his other, the other guy he works with Kyle Metzloff, who I don't know if he's going to make it or not mm -hmm. are like, like genius, like metal casters, like really amazing. And I get to dabble and play with those guys and uh, it's fun, you know, cause it's like, they're coming at it from the so full on science side of it. And the first couple of times they came out and saw me casting metal with a list in a parking lot, they were like, how are you doing this it's like you have no nothing telling you what's going on and i'm just like well, i can hear it i can feel it I yeah can see it and you know and like all these things are like telling me what's going on in the furnace and afterwards they were just like that was amazing and they're like uh next time they brought their students they're like this is kelly listen to him if you're if you lose your electronics and nothing's working that you might he might help save you running your furnace you know by yeah. listening to it and feeling it and knowing what's going on and that but it was really just cool because they understood the way that I'm coming at it is completely different than them. Yeah. But they could see the value in it and understand that, you know, it's just a different way to do it, you know, but it's old school, you know, I'm not using electronics to tell me what's going on in that furnace. So in a way it's kind of like a, a weird history lesson for yeah. them because yeah. it's, it, yeah. Cause this is how it, it, you know, used to be at the beginning, you know, yeah. the beginning. So that sounds like it's going to be an amazing event. And so then people will be able to camp on site camp on site. Yep. Yeah. There's a, we, we, there's a campground. Well, I mean, our farm turns into a campground. We have people hanging hammocks between trees. We got literally tents all over the place. We have people with RVs that are plugging in. Uh, we have a couple spots that you can plug in. Um, it's, it's just amazing. It's a really good time. And uh, you know, uh, it's basically a, Fourth of July lands on uh, Monday, I think this year. And so July 2nd is actually the poor day. So we always pour on Saturday, um, but a lot of people like to stay till Monday. So they're not rushing out of there anyway. So that kind of works out nice that the fourth is an extra day that you get. Yeah. Um, but um, we have it where you can get on there and get different packages uh, on, on, when you sign up and we have some really cool merch um, shirts, which actually the shirt I'm wearing is the down on the farm iron pour shirt um as one of the things and we also have uh, some mugs um that have the logo and also allow you to have um free beer for the weekend oh. which is nice yeah very nice if you get the mug um but uh yeah it's good stuff but the farm pour has just become this really amazing space where it started out to help out our, our crew cast something and um 
the more that I kept traveling around the country and going to Lexington to pour, going to, you know, um, Atlanta and pouring with those guys and getting out into the Western to Laramie and, you know, uh, Fort Hayes and all the different places and Vermilion and all these different other, you know, opportunities going out to Alfred, you know, the more time I, I, I connected with all these other people, all of a sudden it started to grow because everybody's like asking me about like, Hey, what's going on with that farm pour you're doing? Are you doing that this year? I'm going to be driving through that area, you know? And then it just kind of spread. And now it's like 70 artists from all over the country will sometimes show up. I mean, that was our biggest year yet. I think we had uh, where we had about 70 artists there plus Mm -hmm. their entourage. So it ends up being like 120, 130 people sometimes at the farm. And um and we got a full like full kitchen food everything's there live music one night and dance parties usually too because we get sound system going and uh it's just it's it's and it's just this uh, amazing community thing i know we talk um uh, one of my favorite parts about this is is that with iron casting it's inherently dangerous what we're doing you know and yes. and, and you literally are putting your 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 existence and your livelihood in other people's hands. So these people around you become very close friends. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you end up, you, you literally forge a, fr- a bond that is like through fire and it, and, and it makes it a deeper connection than just people kind of meeting and hanging out, you know? Um, and I think that's why these are so much fun because it's a family reunion every time I have these things, you know? And some of these people, I don't get to see that much, you know? And so like uh, one of my friends that came up to help me on cleaning up on the farm this year, uh, because everything that's happened, I haven't seen her in four years. Yeah. It was just like so joyous and so happy to see her. Uh, And uh, and there's a bunch of other people like uh, that are coming in that I haven't seen in a long time. And they're finally coming back to casting iron because they kind of got away from it for a little bit. and, And they're like, oh my God, this is like, you know, coming home to the farm. Yeah. It's just this, uh, it's a, I don't know. And, and you see all the stars out there too. It's so dark out at the farm is like in no light pollution. And at nighttime, all my friends from cities are always just blown away at the night sky. They're like, yeah. oh my God, you can see every star. Yeah. It's amazing. It sounds magical. It is a magical place. It totally yeah. is. And then my, my 86 year old father, he's going to be 87 by then. He, uh, this okay. next week he turns 87 is still there and he's a riot. He'll talk your ear off. I don't know where he gets it from or I get it. <laughs> he's a, he's, he's a riot. Um, but, uh, he's been on that farm his whole life, uh, yeah. born there and just loves it. Does it give him joy to see kind of what you've created in this community that you're drawing to this place? Uh, very much so because, uh, uh, he always talks about how, uh, the community, um, that his, uh, his neighborhood and his friends are pretty much the entire County. Like yeah. his neighbors are the entire county. Like we, he knows everybody in that, that, that mm-hmm. community. Um, and, uh, and they're friends and they're like close. Like, like we had one of our sheds burned down one time and I kid you not the next week, a bunch of the farmers were out there and they were clearing it out and had the place cleared out. And another week later, all the materials showed up and we rebuilt that barn. It wasn't down more than like two, three, three weeks, maybe. But that kind of community doesn't really exist in too many places anymore where you have that like really strong bond with each other that like when one is down, everybody else is there to pick them up. Yeah. And I see that in this community and that and my dad sees that and my friends yeah. and he's like, he goes, I, you know, he knows what I've built around me and it's this community. And, uh, and I know that that comes from like me seeing what I grew up with. Yeah. And then uh, wanting that also. Yeah. And also you're giving it to others too. And that's amazing. Yeah. But I see that in the iron community so much and I love it. You know, I mean, that's like one of my favorite parts of it is the family aspect of it and the community. And it's like, you know, connections around the world because of iron. Yeah. It's such a, you know, it's a, it's a universal item, you know, I know we, uh, other people have talked about it too. I mean, not only is it meteors, it's the core of the earth. Yeah you know, our cookware, it's in our blood. It's, It's you know, it's all those things, you know, that make it the reason I love iron. You know, it's like, I get to like play with something that's so ancient, but yet we've, you know, still so new. Yeah. And, and it's so, it's very everyday common, but then also slightly, uh, slightly exclusive. 
Yeah. You know, sometimes when I mention that I cast iron, people don't believe me. Yeah. Oh, you can't be doing that. You must be talking about aluminum. Is it cans? You're, you're melting cans, aren't you? And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, it's brake rotors. <laughs> so it's, it's a little exclusive, but also not because we're keeping people out exclusive. It's just, you have to have the, you have to have the people yeah. or the people make it, you know, what, what it is. But it's also so labor intensive too. Oh yeah. And that, 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 that'll scare some people away for sure. But, uh, but that also makes all the people that are in it that much more special because, oh yeah, we all know what it takes. And if yeah. you're still here at the end when I'm, you know, and helping me clean up. Yeah. I know you're, I know you're a keeper. <laughs> yeah. Good people are willing to like throw down with you, but then yeah. also stick it out until the end. And, but it is like uh, with my artwork, I mean, the one thing I love about uh, iron is it, it's known to be this strong element, you know, mm. you know, it's used for like the car parts and it's used for this stuff uh, industrial. If you ever see a lot of my artwork, you look at it and it looks delicate. I have pieces that literally look like you touch it and it'll break, you know, and that, and actually yeah. people see my artwork and they're like, are you sure that's, that doesn't look like iron. I'm like, pick it up. Yeah. So you pick it up. You'll know what it is, you know, but I have some pieces too. Actually, even when you pick it up, they're so light and delicate. It still doesn't feel like it because I've made it something completely different. I've, mm -hmm. I, I've taken it out of its normal element of being a structural element or a mm -hmm. structural object. Um, that's a fire hydrant or a brake rotor or something that's like to being something that if you dropped it, it would shatter. Yeah. And that's not iron normally, you know, yeah. but I love taking it out of it and making other people look at it and second guess what the material is because of the, my technique that I made it in, mm -hmm. which is sometimes the rolly mold, sometimes the thunder boxes and, and then the casting and lots of different elements of uh, materials using different kinds of uh, materials to cast with as my patterns. We've pretty much covered it all the way until current and you've talked about lots of different furnaces and I just, so, and we already kind of informally said it, but so you're hot on the horizon coming up is the down on the, down on the farm poor. Of course, everybody is welcome to go to that. And I'll have links in the end for people that want more information because there's still time. And I'm, I want to say it just to like, uh, kind of hold my feet to the fire, but next year. I'm going to come the 20th next year will be the 20th. Oh, the 20th anniversary. Yeah, it's 19 this year, which blows my mind that I've been doing this 19 years down there. And then we did, you know, 11 years at Herman. So it's like, I started thinking about it. I'm like, man, I've been actually doing this a little while. It kind of blows my yeah. mind. Uh, but yeah, my first pour was to uh, 1994 was the first iron pour I went to. Wow. Kind of freaks me out a little bit. I was like, no, but it's good. I mean, cause yeah. the more you do it, the more the community grows and the more you, you know, have connections with people and influence people. And I definitely agree. It's, it's, it's right now, it's kind of a really nice era right now going on. So, um, we're going to go to the after show in a little, like it, I, but I want to talk about if you have any advice, um, man, um, for me, all of my artwork and all that I've been doing with my casting stuff is being playful and like just playing with materials, playing with ideas and not limiting yourself to being like, Oh, that won't work. Well, just play, try it. You know, I mean, as long as you're not like doing something that's going to hurt somebody, um, you know, but like the ideas I've come up with and the, and the ways that I'm casting and the, and the different materials I'm casting into and doing everything I've, definitely researched and I've played with it. And I, you know, and, and I did learn all the traditional ways and how to cast metal. Mm -hmm. um, and I know how to do that. I went through the processes of learning the basics. Um, and then I was able to break the rules. But the good part was, is early on, I didn't know the rules also because of the way I was taught. So I didn't know I was even breaking rules. I was just doing stuff. I was just making stuff and having fun and playing. And that's been pretty much um, my approach to most of my art and, and, and my, my whole art career pretty much is me just having fun and playing and finding, uh, you know, materials and, and, and metal and, and 
you know, objects that I'm like, wow, these are kind of interesting. Or sometimes I'm actually finding really common objects. Like I did a bunch of series of pieces that were all based off of an orange safety cone. And they turned into these beautiful uh, lights that have bubbles, glass bubbles popping out of them all over after I uh, cast an aluminum armature and blew glass into them. And mm -hmm. but the basic shape is actually from an orange safety cone or like a Tupperware bowl where I've pulled something out of it and did like uh, open face slush cast molds, which really scared the hell out of some people when I was doing, uh, I, I was doing instead of rolling molds, I was yeah. actually a, a bowl shape and actually doing an open face slush with the metal. And, I, and then I got down to where I was doing them in bowls and I was like having them cast the metal while I'm holding onto the bowl that's uh, iron. I mean, not iron, but it's a, yeah. a sand mold. And I'm, yeah. like holding onto, I'm like, here, just pour into this. And they're like in your hands. And I'm like, well, don't spill. You know, how good are you? Are you going to? Yeah. <laughs> and so I've done I've done these really crazy fun molds where I'm like doing these things. And then um, um, I helped some friends this last year at the farm pour make a spinning centrifugal mold. Uh, that was a rolly mold, but it was a spinning rolly mold um, mm -hmm. and stationary. And then I made this, the mechanized, uh, were you at Laramie? Did you go to Laramie? No, I didn't. I missed it. And I will always regret it. <laughs> I, I had a mechanized rolly mold making machine that was out of a cement mixer that I'd actually made it. So the cement mixer top could get pulled off and a new one put on. And I made uh -huh. sand molds of uh, styrofoam pieces that I pre-carved in these vessels. And you turn on the cement mixer and then pour the metal in. And then I was like slushing the metal as it was pouring in and creating a rolly mold off of a cement mixer uh, idea. And that it was called the Mecca rolly. And uh, so mechanizing the process a little bit and then uh, just playing and having fun and being like, like, so, you know, then actually when I'm driving a lot of times to these iron pours of different places, which I drive yeah. a lot um, mm -hmm. up till COVID, I was doing about between 12 and 16 iron pours a year. Um, I was wow. running around and pouring a lot of metal on a lot of different furnaces mm -hmm. all over the place. And I loved it. It was so much fun. But when I'm on the road in that and I'm cranking out tunes and listening or calling and talking to friends, I'm like, I have a, usually a sketch pad or a notepad that I'll like write yeah. crazy ideas that just come in my head. And, uh, and that's where a lot of these things come from is me just like, just riffing and thinking about it. Like, well, what if I mechanize this and how could I make a rolly mold thing work? That's you know, mechanize and, you know, could I put it on like a tractor wheel and roll it down a hill or, you know, and I, I've actually kicked rolly, um, rolly molds down a hill. I had a four foot tall rolly mold that it took a group of guys. It was an 18 inch sonnet tube to tip it over. And then we kicked it down a hill and <laughs> like filled it up and rolled it down a hill. That was pretty fun. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's just play fun, you know, have, have fun with this because, if you're not having fun, why are you doing it? You know, I mean, I know some people are doing it to like work through some stuff and get angst out. And I understand that too. I mean, because this is a great way to do it. I mean, yes. to like work yeah. through some, uh, some of that, but for me, it's always been a, a way for me to just get my inner child, um, out and, and play. Um, and that's like one of my favorite parts of it is like, you know, it's that kid playing in the dump. Let's find some stuff. Yeah. And make a lot of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I literally do find stuff. I actually did a piece one time where uh, kids at the school were like, what do I, there's nothing to make art out of. And I'm like, and I, it was at a university and I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, there's plenty of art around here. I was like, went over to the recycling bin and pulled out a mm -hmm. new bottle. I was like, you know, a designer built this, you know what a designer is? A designer is an artist. So I cut yeah. off part the top part of the Mountain Dew bottle and I said, and then I grabbed a coffee cup and pulled the sleeve off the outside. So your hand doesn't get hot pulled yeah. that off. And then also pulled uh, the top solo cup part off of it and uh, glued that together, stuffed the Mountain Dew bottle thing on it. So now you've got like probably three different designers worth of stuff on there. Cause a designer had to figure out all that stuff and somebody an industrial designer or whatever art, designer put it all together made it into a rolly mold cast it and it all came out perfectly you can read the solo part on the top and the little hole for the mouth pieces in there and everything it and i and i call it caffeinated but i was like here's a piece of art that i made from the trash that you your recycling bin basically and each one of those pieces is made by another artist so there's a lot of stuff around you on a regular basis everything around you is made from an artist. Like there isn't anything on, that you touch on a regular basis or listen to or see on TV or whatever. It's all art. And that's why 
it's so important to have in our world. Sorry, I'm preachy. Um, no, it's good. I love it's, it. It's like that area where I just get so frustrated when I hear my teachers and my old professors talk about art programs getting cut. And I'm just like, yeah. they just want a really gray, boring world, obviously, because why would you do that? <laughs> Yeah. Or I think it might also be that the connection is lost. Maybe the people making those decisions, they just can't see the consequences that are, you know, going to negatively affect that, you know, and, yeah, yeah, and so it's our job to, to show them, to show them why. Yep. And that's, that's why I like my classes, um, uh, that I teach in, uh, workshops and that, and kind of also new on the horizon is, I do have a working studio in St. Paul that's uh, uh, educating and teaching. And I've gotten some after school programs going with some kids and mm -hmm. um, teaching people how to weld and how to build. And I, 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 um, I had two older couples uh, come in for a date night and uh, do welding classes with me, which was really fun. And that sounds really fun. Yeah. And two and a half hours, they walk out and they know how to weld, but they also had this amazing time hanging out together. And yeah. um, I've had fathers and daughters take the class. And it's just like that kind of stuff is just like um when i'm not doing the iron casting stuff that's yeah. what really jazzes me up you know it's like seeing people come in and wanting to do something with their hands that's like physical and learn but learning together community and like that just makes the bond a little stronger same thing as what we we're talking about with the iron when we're working together side by side for a common goal i i look at it as, i mean it's like a beehive yeah we all have this common goal to make the honey the honey is the iron you know, and the only way that that happens is somebody's got to be out there busting up iron. Somebody's got to be up there busting up coke. Somebody's got to be making some food to feed us. Somebody's got to be doing, you know, there's like all these little steps and somebody's got to be setting up all this stuff. And there's usually one person that's kind of a ringleader, which is yeah. the queen bee, making yeah. sure everything works, you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, but everybody's got a job and everybody's job is very important. Um, and that's what I love about it. And we all rely on each other. And that's what makes these bonds and these friendships just so deep. Um, cause I truly, really, I mean, there's so many people I just love that are in this community that are just like, I, I, I kind of miss, and I wish I could see them on a, you know, on a monthly basis, at least, yeah. you know, and at one point I was, I was like literally traveling and, you know, one or two iron pours a month. And, yeah. uh, I, it was very blessed, Yeah. but, uh, this last couple of years has been rough not being able to do that, but now they'll all come to your house. I hope so. Down on the farm, down on the farm. <laughs> so let's go, um, yeah. over to the after show. And yeah. so we'll just say goodbye to officially goodbye to all of the public listeners who are listening, but give us a little, can you give me a little teaser about what you're going to talk about during the after show? Well, I think I'm going to talk about the, uh, uh, don't give too much away. Um, I, 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 I cast a molten iron into a whiskey barrel in Scotland. Uh, that's it. And that's it. We're going to go over and talk a little more in depth about that because that was, it, that was pretty epic. That was really fun. <laughs> I can't wait to hear. I love, I love stories like this, so I can't wait. So thank you everybody for watching or listening. Kelly Lodeking, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We're going to go over to the after show, but thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate this. Okay. Bye guys. Bye. <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in. Kelly's willingness to go out of his way to help anyone in the community has always been impressive to me. I hope that hearing his story gave you some good laughs, but also a deeper understanding of how and why he is the cast iron artist and community member that we all know and love today. Kelly, your playful attitude and commitment to helping your fellow casters has inspired many of us in the community. I wish you all the best at this year's Down on the Farm Iron Pour. I really regret that I can't make it out this year, but I am definitely looking forward to attending next year. If you want to follow Kelly on Instagram, his handle is krlmetals, and his personal website is www.kellyludeking.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y-L-U-D-E-K-I-N-G.com. While you're at it, also follow dotf.ironpour, which is the Instagram account specifically dedicated to the Down on the Farm Iron Pour, where you can get updates relating to the upcoming event. You can also visit www.ironpour.com 
down on the farmironpoor.com for full event details, and they even have a newsletter so you can sign up and stay in the know about all things iron that are down on the farm. If you're interested, there is even a YouTube video with beautiful videography and inspiring information available about Kelly and the Down on the Farm Iron Pour. And to find this YouTube video, just go to the YouTube website and search for the title Ironhead slash The Film Lounge, which I believe was published by Iowa PBS. On the other hand, if you like what I'm doing and are interested in supporting the podcast, go to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash podcast iron. There you'll be able to choose the contribution level, which fits within your budget. Patreon supporters at any level get access to the after show recording of each episode. And this is just an extra 15 to 20 minutes where the show's guest and I talk a little bit more candidly and maybe share one more story. In this episode's after show, Kelly tells us about his adventures in Scotland, where he rode a flaming iron-filled whiskey barrel like it was a mad bull. (laughs) So for as low as a dollar a month, you can support the show and get this extra content. Believe me when I say that even a dollar will make a difference when it comes to me affording the online hosting of these files for you to enjoy. If you don't have it in your budget to support the podcast on Patreon, don't worry. I totally understand. But just sharing the podcast with somebody that you think will be interested in listening or watching, you've already heard me say it, but everything and anything helps. And for that, I say thank you so much. If you want to get in touch with me, you can email me at thepodcastiron at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening and watching. I'm sending you all my love always, and I can't wait to share the next episode with you. I'll talk to you soon and have a great day.